All right, Danny, thank you. And Meetup organizers, thank you all. Um, as Danny said, I am Jacob Sisk. Um, I'm currently in California, technically part of the Sao Paulo office, even though there's kind of no way to get there from here. Um, and I will be talking about um, my vision for really what, what I think of as artificial intelligence more than data science at Newbank. So before I get into that, um, I wanna talk a minute about where we are as a community of data scientists and machine learning engineers. Um, our, team, our team has grown. Um, there are, are currently 86 of us, although I was debating earlier today whether or not to count the three who are about to join. Um, something I'm really proud of is that almost half of them are, are diverse. Um, there's always more work to be done, but this is a huge achievement of this community and I'm, I'm pretty happy about it. Um, and I'm just as happy that they, they have really rich and varied backgrounds, like the, the perspectives that people bring span um, in a really interesting way. One thing that's really special about Newbank and, and really unlike any other bank I've worked at, um, or and frankly, any other company I've worked at, is that there's no research function really. Everybody is deeply embedded in teams that are delivering value, working um, shoulder to shoulder next to people uh, you know, for, with, you know, with different jobs, all working together on one problem, uh, which to me is the, the happy, nice way to work. Um, we're, we're growing a, a community of data science leaders. So we have two general managers uh, who are data scientists. A general manager is somebody who's got overall responsibility for a line of business. Uh, one of them, Matthias Roqueta, will be speaking later. Uh, we've also got many emerging leaders of, of larger and larger cross-functional teams and, uh, and emerging business areas. Um, we've got pretty good tools at this point. We're, we're, you know, we've got good ML ops. We're able to deploy really complicated models around credit in a fraction of the time it takes other banks. Um, I would say what we're particularly good at are credit and fraud analytics, causal inference, ML tooling, and things that we're getting better at include language technologies, um, information retrieval, including recommender systems, uh, real-time machine learning, and, and the idea of AI and product. So it's, a, it's an awesome team situated in a really good way. Um, Teresa is going to be talk, is going to talk later about how to, how to join this team, should you be interested. So definitely stick around for her talk, um, because we're always interested in hearing from any of you. Um, but I'm going to take a step back before I take a step forward, and I'm going to talk about something that's really important to me by, about called cybernetics. So there was this guy, you know, who lived maybe 100 years ago named Norbert Wiener, and he was one of these really interesting people from the middle of the last century who made these definitional advances in biology, in medicine, in operations research, systems theory, cognitive science, mathematics, computer science, all of it, just one of these integrative thinkers that were really common in those days. Um, and he, he founded the field of cybernetics and coined the term. And his definition of cybernetics is the study of control and communication in the animal and the machine. What he was really interested in was systems uh, where there's governance and control in them um, that are operating in a complex world and how, how they do that. So I'm gonna talk about cybernetic systems in terms of sensors, controllers, and actuators. So here are two of my favorite systems. Um, the first we'll talk about is the capybara. Um, I have been in love with capybaras long before I came to Newbank. Um, the Los Angeles Zoo had a family of them and I would go hang out with them. I really liked them. Um, so a capybara has a number of really interesting features on it. So one is it's got these sensors. Or so there we go, there are the sensors. So it's got its cute little nose, it's got eyes and ears and other sense organs by which it perceives the world so that it can, it can uh, um, effect some change in the world, perhaps to go eat the tasty snack being offered it. Um, it's got other things too, in addition to those, those sensors. It's got actuators. It's got you know, a mouth with teeth and it's got little claw hands. Um, it has these, these tools where, where it can take what it sensed and it can go and, and do things in the world like go and grab the food and eat it. And then finally, it's got one more important thing, which is a controller. It's got you know, a central nervous system with a brain in the middle and you know, its brain not be very big, but it's a really nice brain and it's pretty good at finding and eating snacks because that's what capybaras do. Um, here's another, self, here's another uh, um, um, cybernetic system, which is a self-driving car. Um, it has the same construal. It also has sensors. Um, and the sensors on a self-driving car these days are a mix of old ones and new ones. So in some sense, the windshield where you can see things is a sensor, um, the ditto for the side mirrors. You know, then this one has LIDARs, I think, on top. And those are newer sensors people are plugging in. Um, it's, got, it's also got actuators. Um, in the sense that it has brakes and lights and a steering wheel and, and, you know, an engine throttle and other things like that. And then it's got controllers. And in this case, the controllers are a mix of people and machines. 
because we haven't quite perfected this and we haven't quite gotten it to the point where it's only all machines and perhaps it's not even a very good idea. So both of these are complicated systems existing in a complicated environment that consists of sensors, actuators, and controllers. And this is how I, I like to think of, of you know, business systems as well as they fit into uh, the businesses in which they operate and where we try and deploy our, our uh, machine learning. So here are two more, more um, close to home examples. So first example, um, one of the things that we may want to do is cross sell or even just sell. Like if you wanna digitally sell, you have to solve a problem that looks a little bit like this. Um, what I really wanna do is I want to somehow show an offer of, of a product perhaps to a customer. Um, and then I wanna find the offer that's gonna maximize the probability that, that a given customer is going to, is going to accept that offer times the value of them expecting it. In this case, I've, I've written it as the, you know, the, some you know, hand wavy lifetime value of the customer you know, conditioned on them going, yes, I really like that thing that you're offering me. Um, so this is, this is a very stylized version of a problem that you know, really every online advertiser has faced. Um, and I think it's a good example of, of how to think about you know, sensors, controllers, and actuators. Uh, but before that, one more motivating example. So this is something we do a lot here at NewBank, which is we issue credit. Uh, we do that in terms of loans, credit cards, um, but they all have kind of a similar form, which is again, we, we are interested in the lifetime value of the customer. Um, but, and we're interested in finding a credit line that, that you know, in terms of a, the size of the line and the interest rate that maximizes that lifetime value having given them the credit. Um, a couple of things are common about these. Both of them are that the context that we know about the customer is an important conditioning variable. Um, and that's a really good example of a sensor. Um, and obviously there are many constraints that I've left out and, and you know, the problems are, are you know, arguably much more complex when we actually try and solve them. But I wanna, I wanna try and decompose it into sensors, controllers, and actuators. So let's talk about the sensors. The biggest sensor is our ever expanding context of the customer. So that context could contain um, um, you know, the behavior of other customers that we have sold things to or issued credit to in the past. It could contain their location. It could contain um, other things they've done with us or products that they purchased from us. Um, the set of things that we can learn about customers is vast uh, and, and ever growing. And these, this is like the core, the core sensor that we have for this problem or these two problems. There's other sensors too. There's macroeconomic conditions. You know, the interest rates of the world may change. Um, the desirability of one product versus another may change too. Um, so those things, uh, you know, knowing about those things is another really important family of sensors. And finally, the competitive marketplace can change. So if we're selling something, probably somebody else is selling something too. If we're trying to issue credit, we have competitors and they're unquestionably also issuing credit. Um, so, so their behavior is in fact an important input into optimizing our problem. So that's another, another really important category of sensor. So let's talk about actuators. So actuators in this case are the mechanisms that allow us to display an offer uh, for, for a product or a service or issue a line of credit. So in the case of offers, you can imagine different channels. You know, there's, there's email, there's an app, perhaps many different parts of an app. Um, there, there might be situational awareness where, where you know, part of an app only triggers if you are you know, within a, spe a specific geofence um, or other, other you know, very intelligent ways to decide you know, even when to do this, like, like what to do once you've decided what offer to give a customer. Um, in, the case, in the case of credit, you know, somebody may come to us and ask for credit um, and, and that moment is an actuator, like we have to then make a decision about whether or not to give it to them. We may preemptively decide that somebody should get credit or, or if they have credit, you know, assign them more credit. So there may be other, other moments uh, that from a business perspective act as actuators in, in that problem. And then finally, let's talk about controllers. So in this case, in both of these cases, our controller is our ability to estimate the probabilities of things occurring um, and the lifetime value of them having occurred. Um, and the idea is to get better and better at those estimators through time. Uh, and indeed, that's what we do. And you know, for things that we've been doing a long time, we're really good at the estimating those. For things that we've been doing a shorter amount of time, um, we're getting good, but, but the, the key is to do it enough that you get good quickly. For me, there's a couple of lessons here. Um, one of which is that if you've got a cybernetic system, a business process you know, consisting of sensors, controllers, and actuators, um, often it can become either a, a sensor for itself in the future, or it can become a sensor for another system. So in this case, um, here's a, a stylized example of one business. So time is going from left to right here. So let's say that business was really good at issuing credit. So here, when you know, a customer, customer J comes, 
um, we'd like to learn, a, you know, you know how to what line to give them in order to maximize the lifetime value at that moment. Um, months go by, perhaps years go by. We get really good at doing that, and now some new customer comes. But all of a sudden, we want to we want to to sell things. Um, so now here we have uh, J Prime, but our 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 context for them may include more information about them because we have better sensors about the individual customer, but it could also include behavior of other customers that are like them in some way. Um, so our sensors are, are both the new things that we built and the history of, of you know, previous systems and their behavior. Um, moving forward, now we want to issue more credit and we have, you know, this is maybe again months or years later, and we have been making offers to people about other things. All of that information can now be included in the set of sensors for the credit problem. So in this way, in this way, um, our ability to, to build these systems and have them throw off the right information um, gives newer system better sensors over time. So perhaps one day we want to make a new a new business, and now we have this rich set of sensors from cross selling, from issuing credit, from many of the other things we can do. Um, and so the, the set of sensors that we have to build better controllers is really rich for that new business. Um, so in some sense, there is an economy of scope. Uh, um, in terms of the data that, that businesses that you build throw off. Um, and this is just as true for controllers and actuators by a similar argument. There, there, are, there are risks and concerns here. Um, and, and this is where data privacy and customer stakeholdership um, are really important. It's important that your customers know that you do this. It's, it's important that they, you have their permission to do this, frankly. Um, my own opinion that, that I hope many of you share or come to share is that data are really people. Um, like the, the boundaries of yourself now extend into databases. And as far as I'm personally concerned, and I'm, I'm not speaking for Nubank here, this is just me, um, data rights are human rights. And if we're engaging in activities like this, it's important that we understand that. Two lessons or, uh, or two strategies, a good strategy for machine learning and then a good strategy for machine learning people. Um, the strategy that I wanna propose for machine learning is to decouple the evolution of sensors, controllers, and actuators. Um, we often like to think about sensors here represented by little brains, uh, getting bigger and bigger and bigger over time. Like I'll just build a better model. My AUC will be better. I'll have more features. Um, and a lot of the time, the real value is investing in building more sensors, um, engaging with the people who, who are, are involved in the business to have better actuators or more actuators. So here you can see, you know, we, we add sensors in the form of little eyes and, you know, then the controller gets bigger, the brain gets bigger, and then we add some actuators and the brain gets even bigger and bigger. Um, in this case, Evolution of the sensors can trigger um, um, advances in the controller or the actuators. It, you know, evolution in the controllers can, can trigger advances in the other two. So by decoupling those, we can get more rapid evolution of these cybernetic systems with AI in the middle or machine learning in the middle. Um, there's a lesson here for machine learning professionals too, which is while we like to think about optimizing models, every ounce of time you invest in, in, in you know, understanding and developing the sensors and the actuators in the systems where your models live is time well spent. So you know, engage your data engineers, um, you know, talk about what, what features you really want, um, help build the sensors. You know, I, I have to imagine that as they were putting LIDARs in cars, the people who were worried about you know, object tracking in the, in the systems are, are you know, very, very concerned with what those LIDARs do and what the parameters are. Um, ditto for actuators. So I think of I think of of AI as a holistic version of what we've been calling data science, um, and the decoupling and the uh, of the sensors and the actuators and the controllers, coupled with investment in all three, I think pays huge dividends. I'll leave you with this. Um, I wanted to I wanted to give you um, um, a short reading list. These are books that have really mattered to me. Um, they're not books about data science or machine learning. Rather, they're books around data science and machine learning. Each one of these has taught me something profound about how data science or machine learning fits into the world. Um, so, so they may or may not be books you've read. They're, they're a little far afield from the normal things that machine learning people tend to, to read. Um, but in case they're interesting or useful to any of you, I wanted to share. And thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Jacob, for this amazing talk. Um, there was a comment here that says, this take on focusing on sensors and actuators is very interesting, and I feel the same. So just wanted to, to say that. So let's see uh, which questions we have. The first question is, could you talk about design thinking in AI projects? Is it something that Nubank uses as a method? Yeah, so Nubank does a fair bit of design thinking. Um, I, I have not seen it directly in AI projects because we don't really have AI projects. 
So, so one of the things that I think is important is that, is that AI or machine learning or data science is a how, it's not a what. Um, design thinking is all about how, you know, you know, the what, like what is a thing and how does it fit into the world and how does it change the world once it fits in? Um, I would love to see more design thinking, you, you, know, you know, design thinking and AI thinking in those conversations about what the what should be. Um, but that's still, that's still baby steps here. If it's interesting, come and talk to us. Is the feature store part of the decoupling of sensors and controllers? Yeah, I think that's, I, I did not think of it that way, but I think a feature store is a good decoupling of, of sensors and controllers, right? Because then, because then you, you have evolution of features, versioning of features, and new features, all of those things happening. Um, and then controllers can, can leverage that, that controlled evolution of the features in the feature store. I think that's a, that's a great point that I hadn't thought of. Awesome. All right, so it's time for us to move to the next talk. Thanks again, Jacob.